This episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast is brought to you by On Point Pomade. Keep your beard and hair looking on point with their line of pomades and beard oils over at onpointpomade.com. Use our code BSP15 at checkout and get 15% off your total purchase order. So thanks again to On Point Pomade for sponsoring our show. This episode is also sponsored by the Bean Bastard Coffee. Head over to thebeanbastard.com and pick up any one of their delicious hand-roasted coffees. Coffee lovers will also enjoy their hand-cut and handmade espresso candles and soaps as well. If you're in the Buffalo, New York area, head to their store located at 448 Elmwood Avenue. And thanks again to the Bean Bastard for supporting this show. Brutally Speaking Podcast is proudly sponsored by Rockabilia.com. With over 500,000 officially licensed items in their online store, you're guaranteed to find something you need. Use our code BREW and get 10% off your total order. Now on to the show. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast. I am your host, John, and this episode's guest is Chris Hornbrook, legendary drummer for bands like Poison the Well, his work with Danny Harrison, and most recently, Greg Pusciato of the Dillinger Escape Plan. I believe I'm saying Greg's last name right. Uh, I don't think I've really ever heard it said, uh, now I think about it. But regardless, that is not who is on this episode. Uh, it is Chris, and I uh, want to send a massive thank you to Dewey Halpus over at the Peer Pleasure Podcast for linking the two of us together. Um, I mean, Poison the Well, if you are a fan of this show, the kinds of guests we have on this show uh, are roughly my age, you know, mid-30s, maybe a little bit older in your 40s and so forth. Um Poison the Well are just one of those legendarily incredible bands that not only shaped what would become what I guess hardcore could be, can be, um, but just, you know, the massive growth of a band um, and, and challenging not only themselves as musicians, but us as fans into you know, different sonic territories and so forth. And, and Chris is drumming, you know, on I mean, honestly, anything that he's done has just been so incredible. Um, I always tend to gravitate toward drums kind of first. They're one of the first things when I listen to a band. It's one of the first things I kind of notice when I'm taking it all in. Uh, just kind of because, I mean, it really steers where a band is going. Um, it is the backbone of a band. And then, you know, it's kind of everything else around it is kind of what I start to notice. And Chris's drumming has just always really been interesting to to pay attention to the nuance, to how he plays for the song, the feel that he has for what he does. Um, I mean, I think he is an incredible drummer that knows how to play a lot of different things, a lot of different styles, but it's always the feel that I think he he brings to what he does uh, and the songs that I think always just take it to another level for me. Um, I guess it's kind of the brilliance uh, of art in general, really, is when you're able to do something and you just can't imagine it not being there. Um, this was just a, a really interesting conversation though, uh, that literally started because of daylight savings time and talking about, uh, that, and then just moving forward. Uh, it is a very loose in the moment off the cuff conversation. Um, I am going to preface and I'm, I'm not sorry, but you know, I'm going to apologize to those that I guess maybe are hoping that we talk about classic records like the opposite of December and so forth. And I'm here to say that that's, that's not what this conversation is about. Um, it really in the truest of senses, I think is about the exploration to find oneself in this world, uh, to find meaning in, in our lives. And I know that sounds really heady and big. Um, but sometimes those are the, the kind of things that we 
on podcasts get the opportunity to discuss uh, if the guest is willing to go down those avenues with us. And Chris was one that was just so open to uh, that experience. And, and I'm really grateful for for him being willing to kind of just go on this weird journey with me uh, into just a, a fun, natural conversation. Um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like anything I say at this point is just going to be rambling on. So without further ado, this is my conversation with Chris Hornbrook of Poison the Well. I'll talk to you on the other side of it. So you on uh, what uh what time zone are you in? We're at Eastern. So oh, okay. You're about three hours yeah. ahead of me. Yep. Yeah, it's still weird how, how that works. Uh just in general, because like you know, it, like I was just reading something a little bit ago, like daylight savings time and all this kind of stuff, and I was just like, Yeah. Why do we still do that? Like I understand like why we used to do it, but I don't understand yeah. why we still do it. We're not all farmers who need to, you know, tend to crops and all kind of things. Yeah, no, one hundred percent, man. I mean, this past uh, daylight savings time completely nuked me out here. Um, it was starting to get dark around four thirty, five o'clock on the west coast, and it was just—it was really brutal, man. Because by the time it hits seven, eight o'clock, you feel like it's ten, eleven o'clock at night, and you're starting to get tired. I think they voted. Uh, it, I don't know if it's California particularly. Um, well, probably is, but <laughs> they voted to do away with daylight savings time here. And for whatever reason, on the way up, it just never made it past a certain point. Like, it needed to get voted on, a, I guess, a few times. And one of the times, it didn't make it. But I was talking to my girlfriend recently, and she said that apparently now, I don't know if it's U.S.-wide, but in California, they've done away with uh, daylight savings. Isn't it funny how something as, I don't want to say arbitrary, but something as odd as agreeing that, like, yeah, this is dumb. We yeah. have to have it go to a vote so the government can decide if we all think that going an hour ahead or an hour forward is is not really worth it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it should just be kind of a no brainer because you're right. I mean, we we do agriculture on such a large scale that's not completely dependent upon you know men getting up early and, and tending to it. We're in a position right now where I think most of, most of it's automated at this point. You probably have a few, you know, a few farmers that oversee it. And it's probably that there has to be <coughs> some manual labor, mm -hmm. but nowhere to the degree in which it was why we, you know, implemented daylight savings time. Yeah. I, I have no idea. I mean, it, it's kind of funny when you think about a lot of the things like that, like I feel like it would help cut down on, at least here in the States anyway, sort of the like jet lag and shit like that. Cause it's like, Oh, I, I, I lose, I gain three hours when I go out to like the West coast and then I basically yeah. lose it. Same with like, you know, going to Chicago, you're an hour behind. So it's yeah. kind of weird how like, just, I don't know all these things. And you're like, why do we do this? Like what, what, like you, like I said, I understand where these things came from, but there's just so much thing, so many things like, a lot of life like as you get older you're like why do we do this this is a very antiquated way of doing something that we don't need to do anymore yeah no i agree with daylight savings time i think with the whole you know obviously time zone thing i think it's just when the sun sets because obviously the earth is turning you well, know they just kind of <laughs> i mean that's i think that's the fun thing too is how people use daylight savings basically as the way to disprove that the earth or the, to prove that the earth is flat. Like, I think that was one of uh Stefan from Deftones like things is he's like, well, like my friend over in like Australia and I can be looking at the same sun. So mm -hmm. how is it that we're in different times, but the sun is like, at, you know, at this and things like that. And you're just kind of like one of those. You're like, I mean, I get what you're saying, but I also feel like if you just sat there and listened to yourself, like literally what just came out of your mouth and thought about it for a second, you're yeah. going to be like, well, yeah, because <laughs> i don't know sometimes like yeah i love conspiracy theory stuff like i and if you go down the rabbit hole sometimes and, and people say things like you're kind of like i mean i don't know maybe there's some there's some validity to that i mean i know for a while everyone's like yeah. 
aliens don't exist. And then basically during the pandemic at one point, like there was a thing that came out and they're like, yeah, we've, we've found stuff and it seemed to have been largely yeah. ignored. And then it's just kind of like, all right, well, what else are they like? What else is, you know, that people saying is like not factual or whatever. And then, uh, yeah, potentially they are right. I mean, I think the moon landing is still one that I find to be kind of interesting. Cause I'm like, did we really have the technology back then to, to really pull that off? And I, and I just yeah. don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm somewhere in the middle with all that stuff. Obviously, conspiracy theories, largely, they they, they seem kind of out there and kind of crazy, but I'm sure there's a few of them that are real. And I'm sure not all of them are as extreme of, like, this didn't happen, and this absolutely happened. I feel, I feel like most stuff you could probably swing in the middle. Mm, and, yeah. and most of it, most of it, like with the space landing stuff, I heard that, you know, that we did go, but they weren't able to take proper photos. Yeah. So they fake they fake the photos. Now that to me, whether it's true or not, who knows? But if that actually turned out to be true, I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest bit. Be like, yeah, well, we needed you know we needed photos because we're having a space race with the Soviet Union and we needed to win. Okay, it's, that's the thing about that one at least that makes a lot more sense and seems very plausible is, you know, for the sake of national. I don't know if it's nationalism or nationality, basically, but of we're number one. You know, that's always the thing that America's always, yeah. you know, before Trump, you know, we're number one. We did all these things and, you know, we beat everyone and we're the best. And to me, I could totally see there being the thing of when there was kind of the 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 race to get to space and so forth. And obviously the the issues with uh, some of our foreign uh I don't want to say allies and all that kind of stuff, but just kind of the things that were going on that I could totally yeah. see. Yes, we were able to get there, but for the sake of appearances and all that kind of stuff, we need to have quote unquote concrete proof to show our people yeah. to allow them to really, you know, get behind us and to kind of on a global scale make people realize like, hey, we are this big uh, country that is the best and the baddest and all this kind of stuff. And yeah. it's, I don't know, it's it's just kind of really weird when you when you start getting into some of these things. And, and like you said. I don't really skew one way or the other where I'm like, oh, this is absolute bullshit or this is absolute truth. I think yeah. there's, like anything, you have to kind of assess, kind of weed out the bullshit and then find, like, the nuggets of truth or your own tr perceptions of truth in it and yeah. just kind of be able to uh, do that. But I, the thing that always amuses me when I listen to, like, when these people come on other podcasts I listen to is they're so, I think they're so used to being shut down and not being able to talk that they just talk in circles and talk over people that you're kind of like, well, this is why people think you're crazy. Cause like yeah. you can't, <laughs> you're basically blabbering for 40 minutes. And I don't think you've made one concise point at all. You're like, well, it's about this. And then actually nine 11 and the lizard people and all this kind of stuff. You're like, whoa, 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 I'm sorry. You said like 17 different things and none of them actually line up. Like, can you please like, can we go back and start with one and yeah. kind of work our way through it? But it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's very amusing. All these all things. That, all that all that, st all this stuff back to what we're talking about before with the space race and all that stuff. It's about perception being reality. You know, people. A lot of people do uh, governments and and um yeah. And then what you were saying in terms of like the lizard people, not lizard people, but the conspiracy theory people. Uh, they just. They have their views and they just, they're not really into having dialectics. They're just into like wanting to prove that they're right. And most people feel that way. Like most people make up their minds about stuff and it's really, really difficult to change your mind. Usually like you have to go through a very traumatic event that shatters your belief system or your ideas for you to either find a way to sort of cobble it back together and keep going because it's all you know, or you kind of have to break apart your perception of things. And be like, okay, well, I was wrong about this, and like, I have to, I have to change my mind about that stuff, this thing or that thing or whatever, you know. Well, I think the thing that's kind of interesting about that even is, and, and I feel like I've learned this a lot from doing this podcast almost for about a little over five years and having like almost three hundred conversations with people. I've learned to be more of an active listener, yeah. and I've also learned that a lot of people, when we're having conversations actually are just waiting for their turn to talk. They're not actually listening. Yeah. yeah. And I've, yeah. And it's kind of weird when you start realizing that 
the more conversations you actually have with people is you're like, oh, it seems like you actually don't want to talk to me. You want to talk at me. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's the difference between, the, like uh, I was saying, a dialectic, which is like the exchange of ideas back and forth. And then uh, just the people just yeah waiting for their turn to talk or just like wanting to shout you down. Like, I don't have time for that sort of stuff <laughs> in my life. I don't deal. I generally don't deal with people like that. I just usually state what I have to state. And if somebody is willing to have a back and forth, then that's great. I'll learn something and then maybe they'll learn something. But if you're just talking to somebody and they just want to keep asserting their point, like, it's kind of pointless. You know what I mean? It, it, at that point, then you're wasting the most valuable thing that I have, which is my time. You know, it's kind of funny you bring that up. Cause like, so I don't necessarily, I have talked about this on the podcast, but not really any length necessarily. But I think that's been one of the interesting things for me in getting older and, you know, experimenting with certain drugs and stuff like that, especially like, you know, mm -hmm. mushrooms and so forth. Yeah. And the little bit of like microdosing on acid I've done, like it was interesting how, in my, as I've gotten older in doing this and people don't show up or they're late or whatever, I get increasingly irritated because I'm like, like you said, time is the one thing I don't have just an exorbitant amount of at my disposal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when people waste it, I get really upset, especially when we've taken a lot of time to go, we're going to meet at this time. This is when we're going to, you know, all these parameters and so yeah. forth that we've set. Yeah. And then that person basically can't uphold their end of it. And it always gets really frustrating. And I've realized, like, when I first yep. did mushrooms for the first time, I became very oddly aware of time. Uh, and not just time as a construct, but, like, you know, the story I've told a couple of times is, like, you know, when I was with two of my friends and they were walking their dogs, like, in a park, we stopped because they had tiny dogs and they couldn't walk the distance we were going. And we had yeah. passed an old couple and a runner was in front of us and then ran past us. And I just kind of started laughing. And they're like, what's funny? And I was like, so I know I'm I know I'm tripping right now. Like I'm in the peak like I'm at peaking right now, but I go so yeah. like we're in the present, our present. We passed that couple mm -hmm. and for a minute they were in our future, then they were in our present, now they're in our past. Yeah. The lady that was running, same thing, but she traversed through two different time times basically. Yeah. And for only a second were we all together, but we are a part of literally future, past, present for yeah. each other. And I was like, and it's a very weird construct to kind of think about when yeah. you start thinking about it. And same with like when, you know, microdosing on acid a couple of years ago, like it was one of those where, again, I just kind of like, it feels like everything kind of slows down and you're able to kind of be in the moment. And that's yeah. not something that I think I typically do. But also, while under the influence of some of these other things, I've become aware of like, like I remember taking, and I don't know what it is or what it was, uh, yeah. a friend of mine bought something off of basically through 4chan, bought this plant additive uh, from overseas. Mm -hmm. And if you just so happen to ingest them in, in different uh, mixtures, you would have uh, various uh, things. But basically, it would take you to a peak like within two minutes and you could keep that peak going as long as you wanted. Uh, so then it becomes a thing of really, and this is the thing I took away from it, but self-control. If you can feel good all the time, at some point you need to realize in that situation of like, I need to to not be at the peak. I need to not be feeling the best that I can and yeah. experience other things. I need to experience the come down and just get off of these things. But it really is a, a testament of self-control. And if you really have any, um, yeah. but it became a thing where. I was dating someone and I was starting to hang out with my now wife. And I remember being like this person that I just met came across town to hang out with me on a random Thursday. I haven't even seen the person I've been dating for over a year and they live five minutes away from me. I haven't seen them in a month and a half. Yeah. Again, going back to time. Like I was like, I don't think I want to spend or waste any more of my time to be with someone who clearly doesn't give a fuck about me when yeah. there's this other possibility of something really awesome. Yeah. So I think, the drugs for me kind of basically made me go, I'm worth more than what I'm my current situation is. I'm going to pursue yeah. this other thing and see what happens. And now I've been with my, my wife married for almost six years now and been together for about 11 and a half. So it's one of those awesome. where it's like, sometimes like these things when people are like, Oh, it's drugs and you're just getting fucked up. It's like, no, if you treat them nah. with the respect, I think that they deserve and you don't do them all the time uh, to kind of, I think lessen some of the, uh, what it can teach you. 
I, I yeah. definitely think that it's something I think everyone should experience because I think it teaches you so much more about yourself beyond yourself. Yeah. And even starting uh, having gone through therapy in the last couple of months, um, it's been interesting because even though I wouldn't say that the therapist, at least mine, would maybe advocate like, yeah, go ahead and take shrooms and, and kind of find yourself and explore. I mm -hmm. think because I've had those experiences and then when my therapist is kind of basically unlocking things for me where I go, oh, shit, I never thought of that. Yeah. Perspective has been changed and I think it's allowed me to really kind of take a lot of things from all of my experiences and just make better life decisions and make be more informed as a whole, I think. Or yeah. more receptive to be informed, I think. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense, man. I, I kinda I obviously you touched on a lot of things, but I, I totally get that in terms of like going back to what you're saying about time, that we constantly live on the the edge of the past, the present and the future. And yeah, like what you were talking about in terms of when you were when you were on shrooms and you were just sort of this realization of, you know, people's different realities and their sense of time all kind of converging and you're existing with people at different points. It's interesting because I, I had an experience where I took shrooms and kind of when it was peaking really hard, I, I interpreted because I was in Las Vegas at the time with my girlfriend and uh, <laughs> I, I, I was uh it was a realization that we're all just kind of like little mini universes, I guess, little mini like planets. I don't know. I don't know how you'd say it, but you, you we're all just kind of converging together and, and existing. And there's these different realities and there's these different like little solar systems that are kind of moving around when you, you know, think about a couple and if they have kids or just a couple or whatever, you know, even just somebody by themselves. Um, and that we're all like, we're all kind of moving along together, converging together across whatever this is, whatever our reality is, whether it's, you know, a simulation or, or there's some sort of merit to what religions have to say or whatever, whatever people's perspectives are, you know, I just found that to be really interesting. And I, I do think that time definitely weaves into that, but I find that when I'm in that particular space, time seems to slow down dramatically. So then I guess that's another question is like, what is time? You know what I mean? Because it's all subjective perspective, right? I mean, we could measure it objectively, I guess. And when you take drugs, it becomes a whole different thing because your mind is being altered. But like, I don't know, you know, it's interesting to think it's interesting to sort of think about that. Out of curiosity, because I know for me, whenever I'm under the influence of whatever I'm taking, like typically I'm very much a, a talker. When mm -hmm. I'm under the influence, I don't talk. I more observe, and I find that to be kind of yeah. interesting. It's almost like a the other side of me. More, I'm more yeah. a focused person. I'm a flip around. I'm I'm pretty really reserved, and I observe when I'm when I'm sober. Mm -hmm. I, I I see what people are doing. I see their their actions. You know, you do the normal thing as a dude. You size people up. You see who's threatening. You just observe your surroundings. Whereas when I'm and say with shrooms, I, I'm more, um, I'm more out. I under, I'm more connected to everything. Whereas I feel like when I'm sober, I'm only connected to myself. But if I take shrooms, then I feel like my mind, my body, my soul are connected. And then I feel like I'm connected to everything else around me. And I, I'm able to perceive more. Uh, I'm able to, to take in more and perceive more as when I'm not, you know, when I'm sober, it's like, you can only see what you're allowed to see, you know, from your, your brain and what you're, you know, how you're conditioned to sort of observe and your, your biases and your, your, all the bullshit that you sort of have, it kind of dissolves when the ego dissolves, when you do shrooms, which I find, which I like it always, there's always questions that get answered. If I go on a really deep shroom, uh, uh shroom trip, there's always some sort of deep realization that happens. Like what you're sort of saying before about, um, you know, you can't live at the peak or you can't beat the peak of a, of a, like a shroom experience. There's a big realization I had a few weeks ago and I don't know if it was all at once, but I just kind of felt myself like gravitating towards this idea of like, you have to have bad without good. Like humans, we exist in a very binary way, good, bad, you know, uh, man, woman, light, dark, like we always think of things in two extreme ways. And we, not to say that we don't exist in the middle, but it takes a lot of work to exist sort of in the gray. And what I've sort of understood is that you have to have one with the, the other, 
one cannot exist without the other. So things can't be bad all the time because at some point you need things to be good and, and vice versa. And it made me realize and accept the fact that like when times are good, it's really appreciated and really, you know, be like, man, I'm taking this and this is awesome. I should be grateful for what's around me because at some point you're going to have to have the bad. And the bad is obviously relative, right? It could be a friend dies, a parent dies, somebody gets cancer. There's some sort of something going on. You know what I mean? And it's just once you accept that these things have to happen for life to move forward and for you to exist, then it's like it's easier to accept. So when those bad times come, you're able to process them and deal with them different uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a healthier, better way if you just accept them. Yeah, I yeah. I think that was kind of it's it's funny you mentioned you know death is kind of being something that we tend to view as a bad thing. No. Nah. It was kind of funny cuz uh when starting therapy you, you kind of at least for me, you know, cuz they need to kind of learn more about you. And what was yeah. funny is it almost feels like a you know, however long your session is basically just word vomiting like where you're like oh this and then yeah. this and then this and it doesn't ever feel connected uh to me like i remember you know we started talking about something and then it was like you know oh you mentioned this person you know what happened with that person oh they died and then it's mm -hmm. like as they we were talking about things you know the my therapist would be like oh well, how has that relationship been settled and i was like oh well, that person died and then so yeah. they were like you seem to have experienced a lot of death uh in your life and i was like i guess yeah. like i feel like no more than probably anybody else but like I think yeah. that's the thing for me is, you know, whereas some would go like, oh, it's very, it's a very negative thing that's probably happened to you. I go, yeah, but it's made me more aware of my mortality and life in general. So yeah, I'm not promised tomorrow. Neither are any of us. So in that capacity, we should try to have more experiences and not be shitty people and, and to try to get the most out of the life that we have because it's not guaranteed. Um, Gratitude, man. It's all about, it's all about being grateful for what you have because it's like, yeah, things could be better you could want more you can strive to have more whether it's monetary whether it's better relationships with your family your friends or you know you're learning to play guitar you're learning about this or that whatever it is you can always aspire to have more but it really is humbling to um to take a look around and appreciate what you do have because there's millions if not billions of people that don't even have a fraction of what you have and it's just we just get caught up because we're surrounded by people that are somewhat our peers you know, sometimes people are a bit a bit higher in the chain and some people are a bit lower in the chain in different ways. And we get caught up in that, but we don't, you know, I'm sure if we, you know, went to some sort of third world country and saw what they had to deal with there, I mean, we'd come back home and you'd walk through the door and there would just be this immense amount of gratitude. It's funny you say that I had that kind of epiphany the other day and it was over the most trivial thing. I needed gas in my car. I went, mm -hmm. I filled up my tank, didn't even yeah. think about how much the gas was at that point. I just was like, yeah. I need gas and I'm getting it. And I was reminded of a time <clears throat> where I had to make like, shit, I got $47 to last me until I get paid in two weeks. I got to get dog food. I got to get yeah. some groceries for myself and I got to get gas. And you're just like, wow, like not even 20 years ago, this would have been a struggle. It would have yeah. been a, what can I, how can I make this stretch so I can basically survive quote unquote and yeah. it was kind of weird like i was like i don't know if a lot of people even have that like sometimes you get to a gas pump and you see someone got like eight dollars worth of gas and you're like man fuck i've been there yeah like it's kind of weird when you just notice these little things and they have they give you kind of reminders of things like that yeah perspective man it's always to have perspective it's always to to, to think about it like man you know five years ago i was here now i'm there or the, the sort of the reverse of that where like man five years ago i was way ahead now i'm behind in this particular thing i mean perspective honesty with yourself humility gratitude once you accept all those things in your life and you you know you the human ego is important in the sense that you know we need to kind of keep it and check it it allows us to sort of believe in ourselves to be able to survive because that's really the honestly like the meaning of life that's what the meaning of life is is to survive it's that there's um well, actually, I, I take that back. I think I personally think that there's two meanings to life. Hmm. There's the objective and there's the subjective. The objective is to survive, right? It's to eat, sleep, procreate, and survive. That's it. But then we've come to a world that's we're just surrounded with abundance. 
you know, I'm talking to you, you're on the East Coast, we have this, you know, ubiquitous, easy technology that's accessible. <laughs> I'm talking to you on a set of, you know, your phones that are that are wireless. You know, I'm sitting in a house where this thing is being transmitted through the air, you know, and we're able to have this conversation, you know, like, we live in such an easy world now that like, there's, there becomes this, this sort of subjective meaning of life, you know, like my meaning of life is creativity and drumming and, and being the best I can be and working with people I respect and so on and so forth, you know, and, and being able to really build the type of lifestyle that I want from playing that and cultivating healthy relationships with family and, and friends and like really aspiring to have really positive things. In my That's what my subjective reality, my subjective meaning of life is, you know? So I kind of think that there's there's two. And if you're really, really lucky, you could intertwine those two together and be successful. But, you know, some people only list, live in the, the objective survival of like, I just need to survive. That's it. And then some people, you know, live in the, the subjective where they're not really surviving. They're kind of holding on by a thread, but they're they're living their best life doing whatever they're doing. And it's interesting, you know, it's interesting to really think about things, things like that. Cause you know, everybody's like, what's the meaning of life? It's whatever you give it, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah, not really. <laughs> Cause there are, there are basic markers that you have to hit. You have to survive. You have to put food in your body. You have to pay a mortgage or a rent. You have, to, there's, there's basic, there's like the, the basic sort of survival. You have to eat, you know what I mean? Like you have to have sex on a, on a sort of uh, biological level. You know right. what I mean? Like you can't get away from those those feelings, you know, so and it's just interesting to think about, think about things like that. Well, I mean, I, I think something as you were saying that, you know, talking about just literally like us being able to do this the way we're doing it currently. Mm -hmm. I think in the last, well, I mean, I guess it's been what, 15 <clears throat> months or so, so about a year and a half, roughly, of mm -hmm. us not being able to do things in person and having to rely on the technology we've had, but probably yep. didn't utilize in a probably the way it was really meant to be as opposed to what, how we use it uh, or yeah. neglected, I should say. And I think that's been kind of the interesting thing for me is like noticing how, you know, cause I've been doing this, this way, basically the whole pandemic. Um, so yeah. where a lot of people were not getting that one-on-one -on -one interaction with people uh, or even yeah. with strangers, you know, going out to have a common experiences, you know, at restaurants or bars or whatever, Mm -hmm. I realized how fortunate I was to have this and have built it in before the pandemic because, you know, yeah. I would walk away and be like, man, I had a really great conversation with whomever. And yeah. then realize, like, there's so many people I know personally that are like, I can't see anyone because we're in quarantine or lockdown and can't go out and can't do all these things. Yeah. And it was one of those where, again, kind of gratitude and perspective. I was yeah. happy and thankful that I chose to do this a while ago because it allowed there to be a sense of normalcy for me where there wasn't for so yeah. many people. And I feel like I actually had better engaging conversations with people, I think because I wasn't maybe mentally or emotionally tapped out from just bullshit in my, like the day-to-day -day world of like going to a job and then like whatever. It's like, no, nah, I have more have more of my capabilities to kind of yeah. be active, like an active engaged person. And I kind of think that's something I'm going to work on going forward where like if it, I don't want to say if it doesn't appease me or whatever, but basically just kind of like, I have no time for bullshit anymore. Like if I'm just not into yeah. it, I think I'm just not, I'm going to cut it out. If it doesn't add value to my life, like it's gone. Yeah, uh, dude, I've, I've been on that trip for a little bit now. Mostly it's been amplified the past year, year and a half, but yeah, it's just like, I don't have time to waste on, on bullshit, man. It's just like, you know, time is of the essence and the, the sort of being isolated during the pandemic was definitely a big, uh, I don't want to say a wake up call necessarily, but it was like a good, it was actually wasn't really a bad time for me at all. <laughs> I was able to come to a lot of good um, points within myself through the, the use of psychedelics essentially and having time alone and, and like really just kind of isolating myself from people. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of an in introvert as it is, but this was really like, okay, well now you have time to, have time by yourself and really think about these things and consider where your life is going and how to, to improve it. And uh, the big realization is that things aren't as complicated as we make them out to be. Like we are the ones are, we are the ones that are making our lives complicated. Things are not complicated at all. Like not to say that life isn't hard. Obviously life has its moments of hard, but we are usually the, 
the object standing in our own way. Hmm. Nine times out of 10. And that was another big realization is like, you know, get out of your own way. You're standing in your own way. You have bad ideas. Sometimes we have bad ideas that we attach ourselves to. And we're unwilling to sort of look at them and, and, and realize they're bad mental models or they're bad. They were just bad stuff that we were given from our parents or our friends or whatever. And realize that we have the power to, we, within ourselves, we have the power to change them. Now, that's not to say that's not going to take time, that, that it's not going to be challenging at moments. But you know what you, at, at the end of the day, you know what you need to do. The answers are always inside of you. If you listen to yourself, your subconscious, if you're listening and your gut will always tell you what you need to do. Always. As you said that, it kind of, and I'm, I'm probably going to ask this in a very shitty way because, like, I'm kind of trying to formulate the question in my head. Sure, properly. sure, sure. Yeah. So something I, f I find interesting just about people um, is, you know, you, you were kind of talking a little bit ago sort of – I guess indirectly it's kind of classism or, like, the caste mm -hmm. system of, like, the haves, the haves, nots, you know, all these yep. kind of things and kind of living in a box, a preconceived box based on perceptions of other people or whatever. Yeah. With you being a musician and having been, you know, Chris from Poison the Well or, you know, working with all the bands and, and things you've done over your whole career. Yeah. How have you realized that or how, how many different iterations of you basically have you found there to be from others talking to you or putting what they perceive you to be on and how... It seems like maybe you have or would have maybe tried to shed some of that to be like, this is who I am. You think I'm yeah. this person. Here's who I am. Yes, I am Chris yeah. from Poison the Well. Yes, I am Chris who was in, you know, the Danny Harrison thing. Yes, I've been working with Greg. Yes, I'm a studio musician. Yes, I'm a drummer. Yes, I'm a person. There's all yeah, these yeah. things. But somewhere in the Venn diagram of all that is is mm -hmm. you, who you actually yeah. are. Has it yeah. been hard to balance all of those or to find the real you and be able to present yeah. that to everybody? Um, I don't no, know if that makes really. sense. I'm sorry if that no, makes sense. I, I, no, no, I totally, I totally understand that what you're getting at. No, honestly, because I'm always, I'm always myself. I'm really comfortable with who I am and I'm really comfortable with my strengths and my weaknesses because I realize I, I am very capable of correcting my weaknesses. It just takes time. So I'm a very confident sort of, uh, aware guy. My big thing is I put up barriers with people because that's just my way of filtering out the riffraff, if you will. Mm. Whether it's you know when when you you know when I was single, when I was dating, you know when I was dating girls, there would be a barrier up because it's just like uncertain of you know are you going to be crazy or are you going to be cool? And same thing with meeting people. It's just like you don't know people's intentions, especially living in Southern California. This place is a massive magnet for. Um, it's a massive magnet for people that are only concerned with themselves hmm. and that they will step on other people to get to where they need to go. And I'm not, I'm not one of those people. I'm, I don't, I don't believe that, that, that is, I don't believe things are a, a zero sum game. And I also believe that like when you're doing well, you could sort of raise, you know, was it all, what all high tide raises term? all ships. Yeah. I don't believe, I mean, obviously there's competition and there's nothing wrong with healthy competition, but I don't really believe in putting people down to elevate myself. I think that's uh, that comes from insecurity, and I think it comes from just a bad perception of things. Um, so, I guess kind of going back to you know what we're talking about, it's like no, because I'm just myself, and either people like me or they don't like me. And if they don't like me, then that, that's on them. That that has nothing to do with me. As long as I'm honest with myself, and I'm. I know that I, I try to be the best person I can and I try to be as honest I, as I can with people and direct and, you know, I kind of have a, a, my own little sort of, sort of tenets and codes that I have that I, I do everything within my power not to break because they're important to me because I feel like at the end of the day, like somebody's word, especially as a man, is like clearly the only thing that you have. And if your word is garbage, then you're garbage. Right. So I try to live by a very, very strict personal code that I have for myself. So it's like, okay, well, we're going to do this thing at 1030. At 1030, I was there, you know, and I was like, hey, I'm good to go. You know what I mean? There's not 1035 or 1040. Or if it was that, you know, I'd have hit you up a little earlier and been like, hey, I'm going to be a little late. There's a little hiccup, you know? Absolutely. So I, I feel like that's really important and crucial because then at the end of the day, that only brings good stuff into your life. 
And that only brings, um, that only like when people, people are w more willing to help you. And this might be a little bit of a selfish perspective, but people are more willing to help you when you're an asset to whatever their, their cause is. And if you're a liability, you're going to get less and less calls to be a drummer, go do this gig, do this tour, play with this person, blah, blah, blah. Or even just a friend, like if I'm, I'm in a hard place and I need to borrow some money from a friend, they're going to know at the end of the day, oh yeah, he, Chris is going to pay me back. When he says he's going to pay me back, he's going to pay me back. So it, 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 it's beneficial to everybody because that person doesn't feel like they're going to lose their money. And if I'm in a hard spot, I get the cash I do what I need to do. And as soon as I get the cash, I give it back to him. And it's just like, you know what I mean? I think it's funny you said that because like very you specifically and a lot of my last like week has been very just circling around each other so uh, yeah. a friend of mine we just drove down to atlanta from here in michigan um mm -hmm. all nice 12 hours of it <laughs> yeah that's a, that's a bit of a drive i've done that before and uh so we ended up uh driving down just the two of us and had a lot of fun um and at one point you know i was talking with dewey who is the one who set this up between the two of yep. us and yep. he was like yeah, man, I think you guys would, you know, have a great conversation. And I was telling my buddy Alfonso this, and he was like, he grew up uh, in, he's originally from Puerto Rico, and then basically mm -hmm. uh, lived in Miami in like the Hillel area. Yeah. And so he was telling yeah. me all these stories about basically your, you know, Poison the Wells early days playing, yeah. um, you know, like at your last uh, place in Miami at Churchill's, I think is what it was called. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then basically like how that place has gone out uh, of business due to obviously what's been going on. Uh, something yeah. I think called the Club Q. I think you said it was like a pool hall or something. Yeah. That was that was like the that was the spot back in the day. When, like that was the most consistent spot to have like punk and hardcore shows uh, because everything else was like either too big or. But that was like the spot that was in the city that I grew up in. So it was kind of funny, like him kind of reminiscing about him being a young kid, trying to like get into bands and so forth, like actually being in a band and then going to see you guys and all yeah, this yeah. kind of stuff. And then, you know, as I was kind of thinking about my own relationship with with, you know, your music and so forth and, you know, like my wife and I going record shopping one day and she was like, oh, I just found like the reissue of uh, the opposite of December and Tear from the Red. And yeah. And conversations about going to see old, like you guys and you know hardcore shows and stuff like that and yeah. it's just kind of funny to think about how even though like you and i up until right now or a few days ago had never met had never talked yeah that we're able to have interesting conversations because of you know just the time we grew up and so forth and you know i correct me if i'm wrong i think you just turned 40 uh very recently I just, yeah i turned 40 about a month ago, ago. Yeah. yeah and so i'm i'm approaching 40 i'm gonna be 37 in a couple of months and it's mm -hmm. one of those that you know in my group of friends, you know, a lot of us are talking about getting older and it's interesting to see just the difference in how we're approaching aging. Like my wife's like, Oh, I, I hate getting older. And other people yeah. are like, I'm terrified to be this age. And you know, like yeah. I, I was telling someone last night, walking the door at the bar, you know, they're like, how old are you? And I was like, oh, I'm this age. And like, Oh, you, you know, you're getting closer to da And so on and so forth. I was like, yeah, man, I can't wait to be 40. Like I'm ready for 40. I'm ready for all those things. Yeah. And someone was like, why are you like ready to be 40? Like you have more years to go. And I was like, cause I feel like you, you once you hit certain milestones within reason, you have to earn it. Like it's one age yeah. is one of yeah. the things you just you have to earn. Like you can't just level up. You can't just be fifty one day. And essentially, yeah. I feel like you have to have grown in some capacity as a person. Like especially if you have a good life. Uh, you know, as you were kind of saying, what is the objective or subjective of, of being alive in, in our lives? Yeah. yeah. And I feel like I have a lot of rich experiences. I have especially yep. you know since being with my wife, getting to travel, getting you know having a lot of the same close grouping of friends that I've grown and had experiences with. And to kind of tie up the, where I was going with the, the financial thing. So the mm -hmm. other day when we were in Atlanta, I was like, I wanted to go to the Hawks game. I wanted to go see a playoff basketball game. Had never seen one. And yeah. I asked my buddy, I was like, hey, like, I know that's the day we tentatively are trying to leave. Can we go to this game? Would you mind going with me? And he goes, yeah, man, I don't have the money to go. I was like, fuck it, dude. I'll, I'll buy your ticket. I want the experience. Yeah. And I want to experience with somebody yeah. else. So fuck yeah. it. Like, I don't care about the money. I don't need you to pay me back. Like, just I want to go experience this. And to me, it's worth paying the money to have you come with me and experience it. And we had a fucking blast. And it's one of those where I've always said friends and family don't keep a tab. 
because you know it's going to come back to you in some way, shape, or form, whether it's literally yeah. the financial or it's some other memory or experience that you get to share with that person. Mm -hmm. Those are sometimes as valuable as a quote-unquote monetary, you know, amount. Yeah. yeah, I mean, money is just, it's just your time put towards something that creates value that, you know, gets transferred over to you. Like I, I trust me, I like money and I want to make more of it, but it's not because I want to make more of it because it's the thing that drives me. Like money is a very like shallow thing. Like it's cool to have cash. Don't get me wrong. Like if you have money, you can own like a nice home and have a nice car and have savings away and you could be comfortable and it could facilitate a certain lifestyle that you want. But I, I'm really, I get really like confused when I see, you know, in, it's very pronounced on like you know social media and stuff like that but the people that like that's that's the only indicator of like that's the only thing that they chase and and it's the thing that they want everybody to let them know it's just like yeah but like i have things that are just more valuable in my life like my experiences and my time and 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 my relationships with people and then the the collaborative efforts of working with people like to me that's like when i'm old and like all the money is gone and I'm on my deathbed, I'll like look back at all of all of my experiences throughout my life. And like, those are the things that are going to stay with you. Those are the things that mean way more than money. You know what I mean? And like, like I said, trust me, dude, like I'm all about making cash. I'm all about having money and like being like, cool. Like I want to go buy this really nice car. Or, like, cool. Like I want to do this. Like, well, let's go on this vacation. Like, man, I want to buy this. Like, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. Cause that's nice. And that's, 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 that's great. And that's, awesome not shitting on it at all but it's just not the most important thing to me it's not even i wouldn't even I, it's definitely within the top five but it's definitely not within the top three or four you know what i mean like it's just it, it's just um it's very vapid it's very just like it's whatever you know what i mean it's like what's more important it's like having like my 20s like with poison the well like we never really made a lot of money you know what i mean it was constantly reinvesting or having to put money towards this or that. Like we never really broke per se to where we were making, you know, what certain bands within our genre, you know, that surpassed us, uh, were able to make and build a livelihood off of. But like, I look back on those experiences throughout my twenties and I was like, yo, like that's, that's one of the cool, like not to say that it's going to be the most important 10 years of my life, but it's definitely, I look back and I'm like, man, like, I'm not obviously making money would have been cool, but like, I don't even think about the money. I think about being on tour. I think about the experiences. I think about the friends that I met. I think about the cool recording experiences. I think about all those things and, and like, I'll have those for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Like, even if I had, even if we like made millions of dollars, like it probably would have been gone. You know, I probably would have invested it. I probably would have lost some of it, you know, or you, you, you buy a really nice home and it's just the home. And then it becomes your baseline of normality. But you look at those experiences and you just look back and, you know, hopefully you have photos to sort of look at them and think, man, that's really fucking cool. You know, like, man, like, who gets to do that? You know, most people are going to college and getting wasted and going and getting like a normal job. And like, I, you know, I went and did this and I had these experiences, you know, it's like, to me, that's more, that's just more valuable. It's just, it, it's more valuable. It's a life lived and it's a life that's more fulfilling. And, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean that's that's, that's kind of it. <laughs> sort of. This is kind of again kind of working through a question that just kind of popped in my head. Yeah, you know, as you were kind of talking about just having the experience of the things and, and kind of sort of reflecting right there on the career, basically very quickly of of you know Poison the Well. Mm -hmm. You know, lately before the pandemic, and you guys are announcing all these you know playing the opposite of December shows and so forth. You know, yeah. like Furnace Fest and whatnot. Sure. Is it interesting to you to have been a part of something that is so widely regarded as like a, a big like statement record and, you know, a thing that defined a genre or a, a fledgling yeah. scene at the time and now being in my timeline might be wrong because I'm kind of terrible with some of this shit now, but it's been like what, yeah. 20 years since that came out? 2021 20, okay it's roughly like yeah it's like the 21 yeah because it came out it's about 21 years and a few months or whatever but in december december of this year will be 22 years so how has it been kind of being able to be a part of something and as you said it 
it ne- you like never really broke the way that some others in your scene did, but yeah. you've had this lasting impact on a scene that's yeah. still going even after you know the band kind of had gone away for a while. Like, what is it yeah. like to kind of have your memories of the early days and now kind of revisiting it all these decades later and yeah. seeing the leg the impact and legacy that it's left behind? It's super cool, man. I mean, it's it's a weird. There's a there's like it's split for me because there's a part, there's one half of me that's really grateful and very appreciative because obviously that record, it changed my life. You know what I mean? Opposite of December changed my life. You know what I mean? I don't know what would have happened with me musically if I, if I wasn't a part of that record. Right. And if it didn't sort of start doing what it did in, in the, the, the hardcore world and whatever, you know, there's a part of me that's like really, really grateful and really humble and just, you know, appreciative of it but then there's the other part of me that feels very disconnected from it Mm. like i look at that record and i'm like yeah that well that was me when i was like 18 19 years old that's cool but that's not me now Mm. and i feel it i i I very much feel it when i play the songs i feel it when i have to get ready for those songs because they're of the the stamina of a of a 19 year old (laughs) dude and i'm 40 so it takes a moment to kind of to put those to put those shoes back on so to speak but i mean to be quite honest it feels like a different life Mm. like i don't you know i don't listen to that record i don't when i listen to the songs yeah it's it's cool but it's not what i listen to now my skill set as a player is like light years away from where i was back then so it's just weird mixture of feelings of like man i'm really grateful and like that record has, has done a lot for me and has, it contributed to a lot of my life in a lot of positive ways but then there's the other part of me that just like it feels like feels like a family member that like you met or you knew when you were like a kid and they disappeared for 20 or 30 years and you're seeing them again and you're connected to them in some way but you don't like you don't know them mm. because it's you're just so far removed from it You know what I mean? And that's kind of, that's more recently, that's kind of more how I've been feeling about Poison the Well in general. Hmm. Like I, I I am immensely grateful to have had the experiences. I'm still very close with Jeff and Ryan, you know, they're like brothers to me. And, uh, but there's a part of me that's just like, there's a part of me that feels like I need to move on from it. Like it had its time and its place in my life. And I feel like there's a, there's a part of me that feels like I'm overstaying something. It's a very in- intuitive gut feeling. That's not to say that, you know, playing shows every once in a while, that's cool. You know, that's always fun and it always allows us to go do things. We can make a little bit of money. We can have great shows. But in terms of like the avenue of making music, more so recently, like the past, you know, month or two, it feels like, it it really feels like I, I kind of need to let go of it. Like I'm not really interested in making new music with Poison the Well anymore. Maybe that'll change. Maybe that'll change. I don't know, but as of this moment, you know, cause I'm ne- never, I'm never going to say never cause you just never know. Right. But it, it doesn't excite me. It's like, it's a point in my life that, you know, allowed me to grow and allowed me to develop the skill sets that I have now that allow me to work with, you know, very, you know, respectable people, uh, creatively, you know, but, I don't know if it's something that I'm, I, I feel like there's a part of me that feels like it's going backwards. You know mm. what I mean? Well, so it's kind of funny because this, this sort of mirrors a conversation I had a couple years ago with uh, Corey from Blood Has Been Shed. Mm-hmm. And talk about a dude that like no one, had, like I remember doing an interview with Howard and basically mm-hmm. I just talked about Blood Has Been Shed because there was a lot of stuff that like, it's, that yeah. was one of the bands that didn't exist when these kind of things happened and they and interviews really weren't a plenty. Uh, so they were kind of in that era where it's like, who the fuck knows about this band or what was really going on? Cause they didn't say anything. And then they basically went away when, uh, Howard and Justin joined kill switch and was one of those things. Like I remember asking Howard questions. He's like, man, that's, you gotta ask Corey those questions. And then he was like, but good luck. Cause he's busier than me and doesn't really, he's even less on social media and shit. And then through, Divine Intervention, whatever the fuck, his kid found that interview on YouTube and was like, oh, it was really cool hearing you talk so positively about my dad and his music. And I go, yeah. yo, I sent Corey a message like years ago on Facebook. Tell your dad to see that message. And if he wants to come on, 
love to have him on. Like yeah. two days later, he, Corey emails me. And then we did like a almost two hour long chat, basically just kind of talking about the legacy of blood has been shed, even though a lot of people may not be aware of their, their legacy and their impact basically of kind of playing a very heavy, chaotic discordant kind of style of hardcore yep. or whatever. And, you know, and then I was like, what, what happened with that record that you were sitting on? That was supposed to be the follow up to your last record. And he goes, Oh, it's like done in various stages and so forth. But he goes, I made the joke back then that I feel like we're like 10 years ahead of what's current. And he goes, I don't know, maybe now's the time to put it out because it'll be right where it needs to be. And maybe that was kind of the thing all along is that what we were doing didn't, f not that it didn't feel creatively fulfilling, yeah. but it felt like, you know, you kind of get to a point where you're like, well, why are we doing this? Like, it, it's not financially fulfilling and there's a lot of other things i'm having to sacrifice that would possibly be, be more fulfilling to me in my life why do this and i yeah. kind of wonder as you were saying that and something i i kind of had talked to with Corey in an email after our conversation but it's like mm -hmm. with so many people and this isn't a slight against the band because i i love poison the wells whole discography mm -hmm. i love the growth uh that you guys showed moving forward yeah. at all times but I feel yeah. like the thing that's got to be hard for you as, as a creative and as a, as a musician, it's got to be hard to have people look at what you did as a whole and kind of focus it in the very, basically the very beginning and always be looking yeah. backwards. Yeah. And so to me, like where you're saying, like, I don't know if I want to do a Poison the Well thing. I wonder if it's because tentatively your most recent experiences with it have been doing older things, not being able yeah. to do something new and putting you into it now where you can yeah. go, man, I love the new stuff we're doing because I get to really showcase everything I've done and, and kind of bring you on this sonic journey with me. Yes. It's, it's always looking back. And I, I could yeah, see I, that being a thing where you're like, I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. I already did that. Yeah. 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 Very, you're very, I'm, I'm also not, I'm not an, I'm not an ultra nostalgic dude. Like I do have moments where I look back and there's gratitude and, and I think about things, but like, I don't, I don't really live in the past. I, I live in like moving forward. So to a certain degree, I mean, yeah, but there's also, there's the, another part of me where it's like, I'm doing stuff currently that people are, are interested in. Hmm. So I, I, I it, it'd be one thing if like, I wasn't really musically active and I wasn't able to put forth me now, but I am in different, in various different ways. And I'm really grateful. Like some people from the sort of the poison wall world, are aware of it and some stuff they're not, you know what I mean? Like working with Danny, he's a great dude, but there's not really a lot of crossover. But then working with Greg, because obviously both our bands were around the same time and had our own sort of impact on music and had toured together. Like there's a lot of people that like Poison the Wall that will listen to Greg's solo stuff and realize, you know, I'm playing, I'm playing drums with him and that this is, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be like, oh, that's cool. Like where he's at now, you know? So I, I, I feel fortunate to have that outlet and still be working with, you know, artistically credible people and, and still being able to, to sort of do that. Um, but it's not really so much, it's it's not so much people in, in, the, in the past with Poison the Wall. It's mostly myself. I just feel like I'm going, like, you know, we're going to be playing opposite and stuff like that. And um, I'm having to get my feet back in the shit because I don't really play a lot of double bass anymore. I've, I've transitioned more into like a like a musical feel pocket guy mm. and like the stuff that i play with greg is a lot about feel and my feel for the music and the sort of compositional aspect of it it's not about playing blistering fast double kick stuff so you know my left foot is really really out of shape and it seems like whenever i i'm not doing poison the wall stuff it kind of falls by the wayside you know so it's more stuff like that where it's just like it'd be awesome just to be able to play that stuff and just kind of snap into it. But it's kind of far removed from my current skill set. So it's like it requires months and months of getting stuff back into shape, which is a little like going back to the whole time thing. It's just like, do I really want to dedicate time to that all the time? You know, do I really want to do that? Obviously, it's different. You know, we have two festivals coming up where we're playing opposite and we'll probably play it at a few shows and that's cool. You know, it's not just for one thing. It's for, it's going to be for like several things, which is cool. But, you know, I just have a lot to sort of think about, but my gut is kind of telling me it's like, it's time to move forward. Mm.
and uh you know not to say that i'm i'm not the, the the sort of the idea of writing new music has been talked about a lot with us but it's just we could never get everybody on the same page you know uh everybody kind of lives in a different state except for ryan and i ryan lives in los angeles but it feels like our energies are focused elsewhere you know ryan's busy with what he's doing jeff's busy what he's doing i'm busy with what i'm doing our bass player brad's busy with what he's doing boys have all worked in the past mainly from my perspective because like we made it our priority right and when we when we wrote a record we were present during that record the entire time we dedicated time to get into a room and 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 write and then we blocked off time to go and record it and then we blocked off time to tour i think it really worked because we were all 100 percent invested into it the times that we've kind of went to go do it now it like it doesn't feel like it, it feels like people's priorities are in the other place, which is totally fine, but it just doesn't, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like we're all in the same space at the same time. And that might change. My, my, my attitude might change my feeling of feeling like I have to kind of move away from this completely. Cause I never really fully moved away with it from it. You know, doing that might be a healthy thing for me. So maybe one day I can come back to it. And my investment is different. My perspective is different. But it's like I still have that same emotional attachment that I had when I was a 20-year-old. And it's not healthy to be emotionally attached to something mm. that isn't going to give you back what you need, what you put into it. Yeah. I think that's a very adult and healthy perspective. I feel like a lot of times... Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I feel like, especially in the, the social media world where everyone has access to like all of you uh, at yeah. 24 hours a day, basically, um, mm -hmm. where people will do the things either for a cash grabber or maybe because they're just kind of getting browbeaten into being like, fuck, I guess, I guess we need to do this. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't like and like you said, the, the, I love the fact that you said that like throughout your whole career, it worked because you were all present for it. You all wanted to do it. You all wanted to be there and with each other to make these these things, these records, yeah. and perform. But that you collectively are all not there to be 100% involved in it other than through the commitments you have currently. But yeah. I think I love the fact that you are all, at least you, since I'm speaking to you, are aware yeah. of that and can vocalize that Yeah. instead of just being like, I don't really want to do this, but I'm just doing it because I, I guess I have to. I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's definitely a little bit of that happening now. But to be fair, I mean, I've also came to a lot of these conclusions pre making these commitments. Mm. And and with that being said, like I do enjoy playing live. The moment that shows become stressful and festivals become stressful, whether it's internal tension or you know let's be honest, we do this and there, there needs to be a financial reward at the end. Right. As soon as, as soon as those sort of things aren't in line with the, the, the having fun, like I have to have fun. I have to, the, the things within the band have to be healthy and have to be good moving forward. And there has to be, when we're done with this, we have to be able to come home with some money. If those two, if those three things aren't in line at any point, then I'm just not going to do it because I don't have to do it. Right. You know, and, and there is definitely a little bit of, of being committed to it because I did make these commitments. Now, like I'm saying, like, I don't I don't want to not do it. I'm interested to see how I'll feel about it with a perspective shift, because yeah. we did. We committed all to all these festivals and, and to the idea of doing these shows before I had kind of went through my, my little bit of transformation. This was all like pre pandemic stuff that right. we had lined up. And I, I definitely came to a conclusion writing. Uh, you know, for sort of, you know, the personal reasons that I said and, and other reasons that are, that are, you know, that are just between me and, and the other people in the band. But uh, I, I've, I, I, feel, I feel quite positive about that in terms of writing. But shows, who knows? It's like I use the analogy of there's a difference of like dating somebody and just casually like just say having sex with them and then being in love with something. Right. You know what I mean? And I'm making... And, I'm making the transition to being in love with somebody and making love to making it more casual and having sex. And that's a very difficult thing to do. I've definitely done it in the past. I know. So I know that I'm capable of doing it. 
I'm just interesting to see if I can do it with, with Poison the Well. That's all. And if I can't, if like I said, if I show up and it just doesn't work for me for whatever the reasons that I said, then then when it comes to, hey, you have an offer, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm just not interested. You know what I mean? I uh, unfortunately have a date with my wife uh, in the next probably 10 minutes. We're going to go out and have a, a brunch and all that kind of stuff. Oh, nice. I could talk to you so much more. I would love to have you back on and just shoot the shit yeah. again. Uh, if you yeah. are game when you have free time, because uh, yeah, right where you kind of left right there, I'm like, oh, my God, there's there's so much more we can go down right there of being kind of yeah. uh, emotionally connected to something versus physically connected in a romantic sense. And just again, like I right there, I was like, ooh, I could really go on for another like 30, 40 minutes yeah. on this topic. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, kind of speaking to boundaries and knowing, you know, all these kind of things, I'm, I'm trying to find more of a balance of doing this, spending time with my wife yeah. and actually carving out time. So um, yeah, totally we're gonna put a pin in it for right now. Uh, if, cool. Where can people find you or anything that you would like to plug online? Uh, I mean, just uh, social media. I have a few different types of handles because obviously people take whatever, you know. <laughs> so uh, I just go, if people want to get a hold of me in any way, just go to uh, chrishornbrook.com. It has all my all my social handles there, like the you know records I've played on, videos, just the, the whole thing is up there. So if people want to you know follow me on social media, then you know the they can get to me through there. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for taking the time uh, this morning for you, this early afternoon for me, yeah. uh, and uh, very much appreciated for the honesty and openness of uh, doing this, which is why I really wanted to talk to you, because I know we would have a, a, a fun, yeah. open conversation about just a lot of things, so no, much appreciated. Let's yeah, let's do it again down the road, man. I'm totally, I'm totally down. Awesome. So that was my conversation with Chris Hornbrook. <laughs> that was one where when we were done recording... We talked for a few more minutes and, you know, I, I thanked him for taking the time and, and all that kind of stuff. And we just, you know, had a kind of carried on the conversation a little bit and he's definitely going to come back. There was, you know, right at the very end uh, of what he was talking about. I honestly, I had to catch myself because I was like, oh, fuck, we could go for another like 30, 40 minutes just on that alone. Um, but sometimes I think it's good to know when to kind of cut something off and save it for, you know, another part, you know, it kind of actually really mirrors what I was saying when, you know, I had taken this substance and basically it takes you to your peak, like immediately, and you can stay there as long as you want. And it's really an exercise in knowing that you can't live there forever. Like you can't just be at the best moment forever. That sometimes you have to have the come down, you have to have the opposite things happen, uh, to really enjoy, like, you know, as, as Chris said, you know, kind of the light and the dark, you have to have the good and the bad to appreciate when things are good, to appreciate when things are bad, that it's not always going to be that way. And conversations can be like that as well. Like where sometimes, you know, you need to cut it off and save something for the next time, you know, and I, and I'm really looking forward to having Chris back on, uh, down the road and just kind of seeing where that conversation goes. The other thing that I love about more of these kind of spur of the moment conversations that we've been having over the last few months on the podcast is that I they charge me in a way that like I I leave my room when I'm done talking to these people and I take forth some of those experiences, some of the parts of the conversation that I had with somebody and then it manifests into other conversations or experiences I have later that day. And it's just wild how if you are able to be in tune with with your own life and just kind of things around you, uh, how that can happen a lot more, how your body will just kind of pick up on some of these frequencies, I guess, that the world's kind of putting out there. And I know this is a very kind of heady episode uh, as a whole, but sometimes, when, like I said in the intro, when you get someone that's kind of willing to go down these avenues with you, it's really interesting to just kind of explore that space um, and learn about people and each other and and learn that, you know, you are not alone with these thoughts uh, or these experiences aren't just yours. Um, I think that's kind of the thing as I get older, when we talk about some of, you know, some conspiracy theories and things like that. I don't have as much knowledge as, as maybe somebody else that might be listening to this even, but I want to kind of talk more about these things and kind of work my way through some of these things with others if they're willing to to kind of get a sense of what is out there. And I think that's kind of the fun thing that I've, I've been doing with this this podcast lately. Um, 
I also want to say, uh, having another really enriching experience, because uh, actually when I got done doing this chat, I went down to Kalamazoo to reconnect with an old friend I hadn't seen in probably two years, a former co-worker of my wife's, and you know, just kind of getting to hear the experiences he ha has had uh, traveling for his job being a consultant and uh, just all that kind of stuff. It was really great, you know, kind of having a sense of bonding again, just the continuation of, of that uh, sharing of ideas and so forth over a meal. And it was one of those, like we, we went to my favorite Chinese restaurant, which unfortunately here in Grand Rapids, we don't have good Chinese food. Um, so we travel an hour back to where I grew up in Kalamazoo and we go to this one Chinese place. And there's something about the tea that this place makes. And I've always wanted to get it, but I didn't know if like they sold it. And I just always forget to ask because uh, usually at the end of the meal, you're like, all right, it's time to get out of here and, and, and go. Um, and so my friend actually had bought me, they sell the tea. It's it's loose leaf as well, uh, which if you know the show, I've been talking about wanting to get loose leaf tea, but I'm always like paranoid about it a little bit because it just turns into this whole thing of like, oh, you got to buy all these things and it's a process. And uh, But my buddy bought me the tea because I'll drink like a whole pot while I'm there eating a meal. And I have been loving being able to make this tea uh, when I'm at home. And over the last handful of podcasts uh, that I've recorded, I'm always drinking it. And it's one of those where it's like I kind of have refallen back in love with with tea and, you know, gotten over my fear of making loose leaf tea because it just it, it God, there's just so many things you have to do. You know, like it's like coffee uh, or I mean, even beer. If you get into making beer, the, there's just so many things that you think like it's just so daunting. I don't even want to get into it because like I'm afraid of the new experience. Um, and I, I just want to say, like, I've really enjoyed having this tea. I actually have a have it right here. Like I said, I'm enjoying the shit out of this. It's just got a, a really nice balanced tea flavor. I want to say it's more in line with a black tea if I had to guess. Um, but I'm still really new to a lot of this side of things. Um, but I really feel like there's something super inviting, uh, about having tea and conversations and stuff like that. And it takes me back to, you know, going to coffee houses and, and, and so forth and just sharing ideas with my friends uh, and getting to know strangers who would become close friends. I know that's a really long-winded thing to kind of talk about this this beverage, but like I said, I've just really been kind of enjoying more of a communal space with people and getting to uh, talk with people about bigger ideas. Um, there's some other things that you know I will share when the time is right. Uh, as you heard last week uh, in the episode with Nathan Mowry, you know, I shared a documentary idea that I'm still currently working through um, that kind of talks about that, the shared communal experience of, uh, you know, beer, music, art, uh, and all these things. And that's kind of very much what uh, this conversation with Chris was about, too, uh, was just a very interesting experience. So all of that said, this was a really fucking great episode. I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up. I know I've been blabbing for a little while now. If you would like to keep up with Chris, it's simple enough. ChrisHornbrook.com is your landing page for everything you need to know about Chris. Facebook is Chris Hornbrook. Instagram is Chris Hornbrook Drums. And Twitter is Chris underscore Hornbrook. And uh, yeah, that's the easiest way to keep up with everything he's doing. He has drum videos. Just go to the website. Uh, same with us. BruceSpeakPod.com is the landing page for everything this podcast. Anything you need to know about us is over there. And uh, all of our sponsors are on there as well. Run through those real quick. The Bean Bastard. Head on over to TheBeanBastard.com. Pick up some delicious coffee. Uh, if you're in the Buffalo, New York area, go check them out as well. They have a brick and mortar store, as you heard in the beginning of the episode. On Point Palm, they keep your beard and hair looking on point. Use our code BSP15. Take 15% off your total purchase order. And last but not least is Rockabilia.com. Head on over there, use our code BREW, take 10% off your total purchase order, support all of our sponsors for supporting us, and uh, supporting the podcast again, rate, review, subscribe, wherever you're able to do that, greatly helps if you uh, are able to, just word of mouth, sharing the podcast, helps the show grow, uh, very thankful for anyone who does take the time to uh, leave us any feedback or share the episodes, uh, greatly appreciated. And for the Brutally Speaking Podcast, I am John, and we will return next week with Marcos from POD. We'll talk to you then. Oh, that fucking sucked. Shao Kahn, what'd you think? That was pathetic. Yeah. Yeah. Coach, what'd you think? Okay. Okay. I mean, I knew it was gonna fucking suck, but...
I think those guys were a little rude. Austin Powers. How about new? Okay, I thought we were going to get the Austin Powers vote. We did not. John, use that for your podcast. It fucking sucks. But uh, you knew what you were getting into. Uh, it will result in less listens. You're going to see a <coughs> decline in listeners if you start the show with that. You're going to see 30 seconds in, the number will plummet. And I will be there at the bottom of the plummet saying, I fucking told you. Don't use this fucking riff. It sucks. <laughs> 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 <laughs>